Welcome, everyone. You are in Globus Books virtual uh, living room salon, and we are so happy today to welcome Matvey Yankilevich, a poet, a translator, a publisher, and educator, and I think many other things. And we are going today to explore all these areas of Matvey's work. Um, and I'm personally very excited about it. I'm going to read Matvey's official bio uh, in a second. But I just want to say, I was telling Matvey right as we started uh, informally that I actually first got to know his work before I got to know him. And it was this absolutely incredible, the best translation of Pushkin I've ever seen, and perhaps the best uh, poetic translation I've seen. And it's a dangerous thing to say on our series because it's called the Literary uh, Translation Roundtable. But so it goes, I'm being honest, translating Pushkin is already an end of war and a deed and a very brave thing to do. And doing it well is something like close to a miracle to a literary uh, junkie uh, like myself. So I'm getting ready to hear all about it and other things. So for those of you who don't know Matvey, his books include the long poem, Some Worlds for Dr. Vought, the poetry collection, Alpha Donut, and the novella in fragments, Boris by the Sea. He is the translator of Today I Wrote Nothing, the selected writings of Daniel Harms, and co-translator with Eugenia Stashevsky of the National Translation Award winning An Invitation to me, for Me to Think by Alexander Vedensky. He has been awarded fellowships for the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York Foundation for the Arts, and the National Endowment for Humanities. He's a founding member of the Ugly Duckling Press Editorial Collective and has curated uh, Ugly Duckling Press Eastern European Poets Series since 2002. He also teaches translation and book arts at Columbia University School of the Arts and has taught at the Bard College MFA, uh, the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics, uh, Hunter College, Colorado College, Long Island University, Queens College, and more. Recent poems by Matvey can be found at Brooklyn Rail Prelude Magazine and Black Sun Lit. And I'll also mention uh, Ugly Duckling Press, which is a non-profit publisher for poetry, translation, experimental nonfiction, performance texts, and books by artists. Um, we will talk more about Ugly Duckling Press during our program. Uh, and here is a good translate, uh, transition to introduce Globus Books to you, because we do carry a lot of Ugly Duckling Press. And in the future, we are uh, planning to carry even more than we do now. So if you're interested in these books, uh, please reach out. And we are a small independent bookstore uh, in uh, San Francisco, uh, Richmond District. Um, stop by if you're in San Francisco and discover our vast collection of books in Russian and uh, a smaller but ever-growing collection of books in English, including poetry and special shelves on curated translations. Uh, so from here, I'm very excited to uh, have everyone say hello to Matvey. Hi, Matvey. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. And also Globus Books is going to have a program with uh, Galina Rimbu uh, very soon, right? Yes. When is that? Uh, I, it's October 17th, so very, yeah. very soon. Great, and um, and that will have a panel of interesting people as well as Galina reading poems in Russian and her translator Joan Brooks reading in English. Um, and we're very excited about her new book in English that's coming out um, very soon. Um, it's at the printers right now. And um, uh, it's a collection of her work over the last 10, 15 years or 10 years, I don't know, she's, she's only 30 and she it seems like she's written three or four books already so <laughs> i'm really happy to be here yeah i'm thank ready you. for all your rather difficult questions so i'm preparing myself <laughs> i hope not to do uh and um well uh, as we just all got to hear one more time you are many things you are a poet uh, a writer a critic a publisher an educator uh how do you define yourself what do you have one word by which you 
describe Matvey and Kilevich? I, I don't really have a single word. Um, I don't, I, I have a profession, <laughs> it seems. Uh, sometimes I think that I have um, successfully uh, joined the ranks of the janitors of the world, uh, as my mom always feared I would. Um, she always said, as you know, in, in Russian, you said, right? So you, you're going to be a janitor. <laughs> um, or a super, depending on the translation. But um, uh, at, at, at Ugly Duckling Press, when I'm taking out the trash, sometimes I, at sweeping the floor, I, I feel a little bit that way. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't, I, I think I've stumbled upon uh, all of the things that one can do in life that really aren't a profession. Um, translating um, literary texts <laughs> is not always, especially poetry is not uh, exactly it's it's one of the uh, amateur uh, kind of activities I take part in, um, and uh, similarly, uh, writing poetry or even being a critic now and then, and having an adjunct job here and there, um, uh, teaching writing or in creative writing contexts or Russian literature contexts. Uh, yeah, none of it seems to be. Uh, um, it, it's all. Yeah, it's all amateur work. Um, and being an editor at UDP, you know, I never had any experience in publishing. Um, so being an editor at UDP is one thing, I've, a job I've created for myself. But um, uh, there are other jobs at UDP I've created for myself, um, including like learning how to publish books sort of reinventing uh, with our group, um, reinventing the bicycle wheel um, every, uh, for, for, you know, every time. So um, I'm, I, I don't have a single word, but I guess amateur is pretty, covers a lot of ground. <laughs> or dilettante is the other word. <laughs> Maybe more pejorative, but uh, fitting in, in any case. You reminded me of uh, Aquarium song, Rubinchikov song, Prekrasny Dilettant na Puti Gastronom, but I, I don't think you're quite on the same path as that uh, beautiful dilettant of Rubinchikov song. Well, another biographical question, which is a question about the biography and the, the uh, significance of biography for an artist and the art in general. Um, and it has come up a few times in our global shows here, because uh, last week we had uh, Ilya Bernstein, whose book actually is published by Ugly uh, Ducklings Press, uh, talking about Mandelstam. And he chose to focus on Mandelstam's poetry only, rather than connecting the facts of Mandelstam's life and death as that we know of were very tragic to his poetry because in his opinion uh, there is too much focus on the circumstances and not his writing especially for uh, an American reader and I respect this and I partially agree but we also had some shows including uh, an interview with Eugene Ostashevsky who uh, read some poetry that was definitely defined by his life path and by, by his immigration, for instance, and other, other things. And Nina Kosman the other day was uh, doing translation of Tsvitaeva and she was of an opinion that her poetry and art was uh, formed by everything she had to live through. So do you think that it's ethical to bring up facts of personal life of artists into the discussion of their work? A and if so, can you say what were the formative circumstances of your life? Uh, and how did your, say, family fate shape your poetry? The most um, efficient way to answer this question is to say, one cannot bring biography into it, and then I don't have to answer the second part. <laughs> but that feels like a little bit of a, um, a too easy a way out. Um, uh, yeah, actually, I've, I've written a bit about um, Russian American poets, Zhenya Stashevsky, Zhenya Turovska, Ilya Bernstein, Philip Nikolaev, um, and a few others, and think 
thought quite a bit about uh, immigration and bilingualism in the work of my generation of Russian poets here, or Russian American poets, people writing in English, um, but with this this particular background, and particularly a background of having um, of, a, of a generation that was a Soviet generation, right? Um, and um, what immigration entailed in that period, which is a little bit different now um, after the Cold War. Well, I mean, it's it's I think really important to think about bilingual upbringings uh, in in uh, in the work of those poets and um, the straddling of traditions, the um, the various ways the different the American poetry tradition and the Russian tr poetry tradition get mixed up in in the in their work in in very different ways, but I. I haven't written about myself that way, <laughs> partly probably because I feel much more like uh, in certain ways my work doesn't uh, or ha in the past hasn't as much uh, dealt with this kind of multilingualism or bilingualism or split kind of identity. Yet, uh, if I look at it closely, I do see quite a bit that's um, that really comes out of um, that ex those experiences, and uh, more recently, I've been focusing on work that um, were on. Uh, I've been working in my writing on um, kind of incorporating translation into the poems, or incorporating translation-like language, um, or using kind of um, a type of English that might be associated with translatees or. Uh, outmoded uh, English um, locutions or diction. Um, so, um, and I and I um, more and more have been interested in in um, exploring here and there. Even a Russian word comes up or something like that. But I, I I'm not totally sure my work in my work that I want to go to a place of. Um, maybe making the English reader um, struggle with some kind of other languages inside the poem. Um, but I am interested in the way that other languages affect my English and um, what it means to, to look at a, a different um, poetic tradition and try to sort of um, incorporate it in some way into uh, my English language work, um, and uh, so I've been thinking about uh, syllabic structures and other things that are foreign to English prosody for the most part, and form, formal aspects that can't really be assimilated in English. That I'm kind of interested in 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 that. So I, if I'm translating a historical figure like Yigen the Guru or Daniel Harms um, or Mandelstam, who I'm also working on. I, I think Ilya is right that there's sometimes way too much focus on biography and political circumstances, but they're also not really divorceable. I mean, it's also for me the history of what that writer, uh, what kind of influences may have been uh, crucial for uh, a particular writer. Uh, when I'm translating, you know, when I was working on Harms, I also read things that he read, um, Myrink or things like that, right? Um, occult stuff or tr trying to understand what kinds of um, language, what kind of stories he was excited about. Um, with um, with Mandelstam, I think it's, in, you know, you also have to read him in his context, not only political context, which is usually what happens, but also in the milieu he thrived in, um, in Petersburg before the revolution and also after and in Moscow. I've been looking at how um, his connection to artists uh, of his generation and older that he shared aesthetic ideas with and finding, and you know, obviously his time in, in studying in Germany and what kinds of aesthetic theory uh, were uh, kind of in his, in his view, uh, in his, um, in his purview at, 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 as a young man um, and where, you know, where his poetics come from, right? Not just um, what kinds of um, 
ideas were circulating at the time is also really important, I think, to, to the work, um, to translating the work uh, and presenting the work. Um, but also in Mandelstam's case, I think the political context is really important, but it's also important not to see him as a victim or sort of object, uh, but rather as a subject who is dealing with um, a very complicated political time where, where at first he basically kind of um, challenges the regime and then backtracks and then tries to figure out how to become a Soviet poet and um, has all sorts of ambivalent feelings about um, his role in Soviet poetry or his recognition as a poet in the Soviet period in the, in the Soviet society. So it's, it's really not just about he was, he was uh, exiled or imprisoned or persecuted or uh, it's, it's, you know, where he is like the direct object of, of the political um, regime. Rather, I, I think, try to think, um, think through in the poems, what, what is he doing? What is he, what are, what are the various signals he's giving in the poems in the, because I'm translating the late poems, the Baronish notebooks with my colleague, John High. And um, we've been working pretty intensely during this uh, lockdown period um, on, by, the, by phone several times a week, uh, translating po poems from like 1936 and 1937. Very difficult times for, for Mandelstam in terms of his health. Um, I mean, you know, every people have written about the connection between Mandelstam's poems and his, his um, heart issues, his breathing, things that he talks about in the poem, breath, a lot of the time. Um, or halted or stilted or sort of uh, um, a kind of breath that comes not, does not come easily. So, you know, it, it, you can't, you know, Mandelstam is always talking, auto, uh, writing autobiographically. So it'd be kind of weird not to think about, but, you know, not to think about the biography. He talks about trips he's taken to Tbilisi 10, 15 years before or, um, or the Crimea or, talks about um, little like country roads and um, <clears throat> and uh, that have a particular biographical point in mind that that he's conscious of so to not look at what what was going on where why does he talk about Tambov where he went to a sanatorium for instance um, and describe this entering the city by train you know so like you, you, you kind of have to know why did he go to Tambov and what year and how is he remembering something from a year ago or did this just happen last week, you know, or is it in the present? Is he writing the poem as he's entering Tambov? You know, so the biography plays a huge role in uh, figuring out what is the poet's attitude in the moment of the poem or what is the relationship to those biographical events? Is it later? Is it a processing of a older memory or <clears throat> what is he looking at? What, especially with art, with Mandelstam visual art, what is he seeing in magazines? What is he seeing in, um, in uh, reproduction, but also in the Baronish uh, museums where he's in exile? There's a museum where with particular paintings on loan from Petersburg in a particular time in 1935 that he would have seen. So there's, there's that, there's that whole context, not just like Stalin this, Stalin that, you know, <laughs> it's, it's much more complicated and, and much more daily and um, mundane in some ways, you know. Uh, you know, he, he talks about a, a Soviet artist that um, he would that he was friends with um, in one of the late poems, and uh, turns out that there's a very strong likelihood that he would have seen that month an architectural uh, magazine that had images of a frieze uh, in a new um, train station uh, or a, a whole like fresco, uh, rather uh, by this artist which he may not have seen in person, but he's definitely referencing it. Um, you can tell by the imagery in the poem. So it's, uh, you know, you kind of have to figure out well, what, what image is he referencing potentially in order to be able to see what, what he's seeing in order to translate the poem, or at least to give commentary on the poem. It may not be in the words in the end, you know, in the translation so, presently, but it does, for me, that interpretive aspect of translation is the, is the key.
um, uh, it's, it's sort of the key motivator uh, in a way. Like I'm trying to understand Mandelstam from a post-Cold War perspective. So I'm not thinking of him as a victim, I'm thinking of him as an actor. It's fascinating uh, for, for many reasons. One of them is because I was trying to now focus on your biography and whether it's relevant. Oh, yeah. At first, as a translator, I moved through quickly to yeah. other. Which is great. I mean, that's, that defines you, I think, in a way. And uh, I think it would be great to hear some of the tr new translations. I'll read one that we just finished. This is my, uh, myself and the poet John High. Uh, we've been working on this for 15 years. <laughs> um, so um, I'm going to read a poem from February 4th, 1937. The first line in Russian is, Razrivy Kruglich Bucht. It's a beautiful, difficult poem. It has all these sound, you know, repetitions that are incredible in the Russian. And we are trying to do something about that, but we're also trying to make a poem that, you know, isn't obscuring the meanings or the, uh, the grammatical structure also. Ruptures of round coves, cartilage, azure, a languid sail made longer by a cloud, cut off from you, though I had barely known you, sour seagrass tangled as organ fugues, false hair, it smells of some long-lived lie, my head drunk with this iron tenderness, as rust gnaws slowly at the sloping shore, so why these other sands under my head? Guttural urals, broad-shouldered Volga banks, or this plain province, here are all my rights. I owe it still, full chest, to breathe them in. Again, that was Mandelstam in 19, early 1937, um, in an English version. I want to get back to the whole the biography conundrum and based on what you said and what you've been saying about Mandelstam, which I thought was the right way to, to look at this uh, as putting the poet or the art in the context or the person and history in the context. And here also tying it up to you and your circumstances, would you be uh, willing to say a little bit how were you formed or what was the influence on you or your poetry by uh, academician Sakharov and Helena Bonnet? Uh, Andrei Sakharov was a physicist and then human rights activist and was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1975. And my grandmother, Helena Bonner, married uh, Sakharov in the early 70s. Um, they, were, they were each other's second spouses. And so I grew up with, um, uh, Sakharov as my as a grandfather because um, that's who I knew when I was born. You know, for when we left in 1977, my my immediate family and um, my dad, my mom, my sister, and I. And um, in 70 September September or so August 77, and um, <clears throat> came to first Italy, then the States, and um, meanwhile uh, Sakharov and Bonner for especially maybe younger people don't know those names. It remained in the Soviet Union and then were in, the, in 1980 exiled to a small city, um, Gorky. Um, and I mean, there's a lot more details to be, <laughs> they're, they're, it's more a little more complicated, but, um, uh, and so um, my family in the States was very involved in a campaign to attempt to, well, make contact uh, or create, uh, situa a situation where the global Western community would put pressure on the Soviet Union to release Sakharov and other dis uh, other dissidents who were prisoners of conscience, as the term went in the that those days in the late Cold War, uh, from labor camps or ex internal exiles or prison, etc. So, uh, psychiatric forced psychiatric treatment and so forth. So. Uh, my father and my mother were extremely uh, tied up and involved both personally and politically in that movement, even uh, especially when they were in the States, <laughs> um, because they were sort of on this side 
um, attempting to do something for those who were remaining in that movement on the other side. In Globus, we have not just literary talks, but sometimes uh, history and other subjects. And we were very lucky to meet with Pavel Litvinov, who worked very closely with Academician Sakharov at some point. And he said a very interesting thing. He said that in many ways, their movement, the human rights movement in the Soviet Union in the 60s, were formed and moved by uh, the tradition of Russian literature, by Russian literature, uh, focusing on the, uh, on the grief of a small man, of a small, just one person, and how they were formed by Dostoevsky or Chekhov and so forth. So do you think that um, your family, in a way, also were formed that way? Were they influencing you? Also, what made this transition for him to go from uh, being the man behind the nuclear bomb uh, invention to the human rights defendant? Was it moved by and informed by literature? Was there something else behind it? Uh, so your question is both like um, my view of Russian dissident or human rights activist history is of course both you know from what I've read around or kind of know uh, and also through family um, and and those are kind of different things. Of course, most of the people involved in the Russian dissident movement of the 60s and 70s and 80s, which started in basically late the late 50s with Volpin, uh, Alexander Yesenin Volpin, who was a uh, son of Yesenin, so, or it wasn't he, so um, he, uh, literature plays a very strong role in the history of that movement for that reason, but also with other many poets involved in that movement. You know, you can think about Gorbanevska, but many others too. But, I mean, I think thinking about the Russian human rights movement as coming out of Gogol's overcoat is is a fine <laughs> is a fine way to 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 do it. But I think the concerns were varied. I think there was, you know, so many of the people involved in the early kind of formation of different human rights groups. There were different ones. It wasn't just one group. Uh, there was the group around Chilidze that my grandfather was very. Uh, particularly involved with um, a Moscow group. Um, there were uh, different Samizdat publications that were connected to this movement. A lot of them connected to writers. Uh, and a lot of the cases uh, that my grandmother and, and her friends were really particularly rallying around were cases like Sinyavsky and other writers who were being um, persecuted in the late 60s and early 70s um, and mid 70s and so forth. So. Sinyavsky, also known as Avram Teretz, right? So, yeah, there, there, there was a strong connection to literature, and of course, there was a strong connection to literature that was not circulating Mandelstam, you know, or others who were circulating more in Samizdat. Um, I would say that there was a strong interest from from my experience and my family experience was just a an interest in reading. Um, in reading, you know, was it, whether it was Solzhenitsyn or et cetera, all sorts of things that were not, um, that were circulating in Samizdat that were not easily available. But like, I think my dad uh, became part or like came to my grandmother's house, my mom's mom, partly, uh, you know, he was friends with my mom, then they got married. But I think one of the main draws for him in that house was the, abil the availability of Samizdat. <laughs> I think he was just like, whoa, I can read all this stuff here. So he kept coming back and coming back and then a relationship formed with my mom. And uh, it so happened that my grandmother was a conduit for a lot of uh, manuscripts going to the West and so forth. So there's a lot of material coming through. But in Samizdat, uh, was a really, I think, an in, is an interesting um, phenomenon because it, it includes everything from human rights um, uh, chronicles and various like political texts to literary, to very, um, very highly aesthetic uh, and non-political literary texts that um, all circulated kind of in the same formats and in the same system, right? Uh, and I, I do think that in my you know, probably 
as a background of my activity as a publisher, for me personally, Sana's Dot is, is like hovers there as a sort of um, paradigm that is not totally dissimilar, but very different from American small press um, and Mimeo revolution traditions. I see Kyle here who has the magazine Mimeo Mimeo. Um, so I, I think, you know, I'm interested in the reproduction technologies, the printing technologies that people were using in Samizdat materials as much as, and, and thinking about how they ver diff differed, but also how similar they were to some of the same technologies being used in the US in the 60s and 70s, right? What here in the US was limited by economics, um, more, you know, in a, in a somewhat, or circumscribed in a way by economics and um, the market was circumscribed very differently in the Soviet Union in terms of the ideology. And, uh, but even in the US, you have uh, some interesting uh, cases of, of um, censorship stuff, but mostly having to do with, of course, uh, obscenity trials, <laughs> and not so much with, not as much with um, political trials, though with McCarthy on the heels of the small, you know, it, just at the beginnings of the small press movement, you're coming out of a McCarthyist period. So actually you do have these magazines starting in the 60s, like Culture, writing about Cuba with Leroy Jones going to Cuba and writing about it. It's, uh, you know, it's on the heels of, of the Red Scare and all of that. So it's kind of, um, uh, you know, the, the Cold War pervades all of these things on both sides of, of the uh, uh, of the Iron Curtain, <laughs> right? Um, which I find quite fascinating and, and um, have been trying to do a little bit of research about. Whether my grandfather or grandmother thought of their human rights work in relationship to literature, well, you know, I think, you know, for a lot of, especially because Russia became so secular kind of in a forced way, you know, literature took that um, place for a lot of people, um, ideas of ethics or morality or, um, or the protecting the small, un, you know, the, 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 the Gogolian kind of character of like this, this the guy who, who just gets trampled over or his fur coat get or his overcoat gets stolen or um, or variously um, you know persecuted by life you know um, uh, to sort of uh, th that character is of course very much on on people's minds uh, but uh, or that trope and um, but the human rights movement in a way was much more legally oriented right it was uh, about the Soviet constitution and abuses of that constitution in, in many ways. Not every, but never, every group was working that way, but many of the groups were working on connect, you know, making sure the Soviet Union kept to the Helsinki Accords. You know, these were just, you know, international issues that the, that, or standards, right, that the Soviet Union was not adhering to. So they didn't, and those didn't have that much to do with Russian literature in particular, though, of course, you can ta say that Tolstoy or so forth lays the ground for, you know, uh, it's certainly an important, these figures are important um, in, in world history in terms of shaping those ideas, right? But um, it's a little bit indirect, I would say. I feel there's so much of these indirect connection it's all indirectly connected and one flows into another even uh what you are saying now about uh summers that and thomas that uh, is fascinating because at globus we have this vast collection of thomas that uh because the previous owner uh used to collect it so we have shells and shells of chalitza and that used to be Michehova and artists and what not pretty much anything that was there is there and so when I was preparing for a talk with Litvinov I had a chance to just go through the original of this Thomas that and when I was growing up uh, I was on the receiving end of this because somebody would sneak these things through my family part of it lived in New York
work. So they would send it to my parents somehow. I don't know exactly how. And as a kid, I would find I was interested more in Nabokov and reading Lalita under the bed, you know, hiding. But there were all sort of literature. And so now I'm getting to see how it was done and who was doing it. And it's it's unrolling alive and it's, it's more interesting than any documentary on that that could be so we do have a lot of these books and i guess I maybe just to interrupt you for a second to clarify for those of in the audience who aren't uh russian speaking uh tom is that as i i knew someone would ask kyle tom is that is uh you know if sam is that is self-publishing uh, Sam is self, and Izdat is the sort of short, shortened, um, very Soviet uh, abbreviation of to publish or publishing house. Or so Tom Izdat is there, there published, or there publishing, like over there, um, oh, over there. <laughs> um, so Tom Izdat was everything that was being published in in the in the West that was being smuggled out of Russia, or just sometimes it was just available in the West and but not being published in Russia. So sometimes the Tom is that publications would be snuck back in. Uh, so they would be in circulation also in the Soviet period through alongside Sam is that, which was sort of autochthonous or whatever, indigenous <laughs> to the situation. Uh, so it's a kind of an interesting circulation and distribution uh, system. Because some some of that was then published in Thomas that and then would make it back and so you know um, stuff like that. I hope that explains that a little bit. And uh, Serena, you should have uh, Yasha Klotz, who is you should do a roundtable about Thomas that because the history of Russian language publishers in the U.S. is super interesting, um, and he's a he knows all about it. So and there's a and there are a, lot, a few other people. I'll put you in touch. A few yeah, other that, people working on that history. Yeah, definitely. a lot of it in New York, Chekhov Publishing, and other things. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. And we have the books, so it would be interesting to put the. Public. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, and thank you so much for clarifying. It to be quite honest, I just got carried away. Usually I'm better at explaining and not assuming that the audience knows something, but I just forgot that there was an audience. So I, my apologies and thank you, Matvey, for making it clear and stop me anytime. So, uh, but it, uh, I had this other question in mind and that's probably why I got carried away, is that, um, you, you know, this whole connection between social structure and circumstances and politics slash history and literature and poetry, literature and art that we are talking about now. So that leads me to the next question. And kind of I was going to ask it one way, but I'm going to ask it, like turn it from the head all the way around. Uh, do you think poetry in particular and literature in general should be or could be or is is it ethical for it to be above the fight in Roman Roland's words or does it have an obligation to respond to the events of today to political events to social mm -hmm. events and which eventually would lead us what is poetry this is just a small question there <laughs> Yeah, I don't think uh, anyone probably has a, a good answer for what is poetry. Um, uh, or sh if, if they do, it should be suspect or one should be suspicious of it. I, I don't quite understand in a way the debate around, and it is such a Cold War debate too, about whether literature should, is, is tasked with some kind of social you know, it's, it, what's, the, what's the word? Uh, it, that it has to respond to the politics or the social issues of the day, that it, um, that it is responsible for something like that. I mean, you get it on both sides, right? You get, but you, you get it particularly in, in, on the left, um, though in, in, in less obvious ways, you get it on the right too. Right, because the the idea that literature should be apolitical and about the individual or the Iowa Writers Workshop idea of like the voice and direct communication 
from interiorities, right? That's also political. It's also about establishing uh, a difference from the Soviet perspective. And if you think about the Iowa Writers Workshop being founded just after the Gorky's Literary Institute in Moscow, and the sort of the race to have the best creative writing program, <laughs> which the so the Soviets got there first, but uh, the Iowa school really was a very formative school that still has repercussions. Uh, and not that Iowa's program is the same now, but that early formation of American literature during uh, even the, you, just before the Cold War, the World War II and into the Cold, Cold War, that formulation of what literature should be was um, as as it was supposed to be apolitical. It was a political because of that. It was a really strong political stance that we were that that we're about the individual. That we're about um, this idea of um, uh, some kind of uh, developing one's voice, writing about what you know, all of these cliches were developed in that um, moment. And, and it is a highly political idea. Um, so, uh, but really this question uh, of um, whether literature is tasked in some social sense, uh, seems to me like a question that uh, emerges from, um, well, or perhaps is just simply a, an impossible question because it, it doesn't take into account that literature is already tasked. <laughs> like it doesn't, it doesn't need to be, um, uh, this, the, the, the question seems always to me that the way that it came up during uh, the 20th century, a lot of the time, was sort of a, a, uh, a really politically motivated and uh, used against writers, right? Um, you're not towing the line, you know, you get in trouble. And same thing for, you know, both on both sides, you know, if you're writing too politically in the, in the U.S., you're not going to go to Iowa, right? So, um, and... Um, uh, or you might not be published in in the ways that you might want to be published. Uh, but the, the the question itself is problematic because, to my mind, poetry and I I I say you know the novel has very different political um, and social uh, sort of intentions often, right? As a, as a genre, um, you know it 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 often partakes in some kind of a, educational or um, uh, enlightenment, kind of enlightening kind of uh, mode that it, it has a function, right, for society, or it is a satire or it is, you know, critical of society, of some social ill, or you know, whether it's Balzac or Stern or what, you know, whereas poetry, uh, to my mind, I mean, modern poetry since the 1850s or something, but also many, uh, older and classical traditions is excess, right? It, it's always uh, outside of the, the system of capital. For me, it's not really poetry unless it's doing something that society doesn't really need. <laughs> and so in, in that case, uh, it's sort of not a question for poetry. It, it's already confronting and transgressing the, the idea that it needs to do something. That it needs to have a function, a social, um, a, uh, a sort of some, some kind of good, bring some kind of you know positive thing to the to the world. It's already transgressing that. It's it's already uh, indulgent or whatever you might say about it. Um, it's already too personal. It's already too abstract. It's already you know whatever it is. Um, it's it's uh, it's already excessive, and it, it's it's already transgressing this idea that it could be uh, utilized for anything. So, I, and I, to me, poetry is literature, right? It's like it's art, right? Um, it, literature, though, has you know, I, maybe that's wrong. I mean, I think literature does have. There's there's a lot of kinds of literature, and it's diff with different functions and historically. I would say like there just are different uh, time, different eras of, of what literature needed to be to be literature, right? 
So it's, it's really, one can't really say that there's some abstract general truth about it because it's so historically uh, contextualized uh, in each case, right? In the Enlightenment, you have a different idea of what literature is and what it should do. And in our period, it's, it's something very, very different. And, um, uh, you know, you have Seneca and you have Kyle Schlesinger or you have, um, who's here, or David Perry, who's here, um, or Ivan Sokolov, who's here. And they're, they're not the same. They're not very different uh, ideas of what poetry or what a literary text needs to do. It's not there to like educate you in some way or morally educate you, right? Because we're children of a post 1850s, you know, post Baudelaire world. So we can't, we can't really, <laughs> but, but that is to say that that doesn't make Seneca or Shakespeare or whatever, like not, um, uh, or Cicero or Ovid, not literature, right? Or, or Dufu or whoever, right? So um, it's just a different, they, each time has its own um, kind of paradigm for what the literature is. But to my mind, it's like literature is, I mean, poetry is this, continues for me. Uh, I don't think we've totally shifted paradigms yet. And for me, the paradigm of Mallarmé and poetry as a as a bomb is still the is still the paradigm it's like that's how i if, if i if the paradigm shifted i may i may not be able to uh, evaluate or say like uh, this is good poetry or this is bad poetry or this isn't poetry right because my paradigm is the poem is uh, already something that society rejects that it doesn't pay me for that i that i'm producing into that void or into that trans as a transgression. Um, uh, otherwise it doesn't have meaning to me, but that's my paradigm. Like I can't um, say that that's gonna be the paradigm 50 years from now uh, or even tomorrow. So I, I live in that. And in that paradigm, I don't think the question of whether poetry needs to answer some kind of call of social, you know, uh, has to, you know, address something or, you know, has to be political in a particular way or uh, I just don't think it's a valid question. Mm, it, or it, uh, it's like a paradoxical question. Like it doesn't, it's already poetry is doing its thing. And it, it doesn't, uh, just by existing, it's already doing that thing. <laughs> um, that's my my take on it, and I'm sure people will disagree. <laughs> and I like to ask that people I speak to in general and people I speak to on Globus show and hear all the different answers. So in a way, you know, it's and to compare and they always learn, and it never fails to fascinate me how many answers there <laughs> there are to the question. And also because to me, I always think of poetry, literature coming from poetry and poetry going back to shamanic chant. And that by itself has the healing uh, quality, as you say, it does it anyway, but also the societal quality because shaman is, has the chief function in, in the tribe. So, so, and then it goes and develops and then it turns into something completely different. And here we are debating or not debating whether it has uh, this, this angle or not, and whether we as poets have the responsibility to respond to pandemics or something else. And I hear that in San Francisco in poetry community, you hear that all the time. And so, and there, of course, there's no answer. There can't be an answer, <laughs> but it's always interesting to hear what people feel about that. Interesting that you bring up the shamanic kind of poem or the poem that serves a ritual function in a society. And I don't think, I, I think we still have that in certain ways, but it's not for me, the paradigm of what I would call uh, sort of literary poetry at the moment, you know? It uh, seems that um, I, I wonder what what poets were writing during a, 
let's say, in a society where uh, the privileged idea of poetry was a shamanic chant. Like what were, I wonder what the outliers were doing, you know, like <laughs> that were just like doing something else and we don't know about it, right? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there were people, you know, language is this thing, like people, I'm sure it's like, um, it's exciting, you know, uh, to let it go. Like um, I read recently about Kendrick Lamar, like rapping for 20 minutes as a kid, like just walking down the street, like just making up rhymes. So like the way that language wants to generate itself, you know, um, and and the way you get caught up in it, it, it may, may have had manifestations we just don't know about in the same way that like, some some minor Soviet writers are are just coming out now. Um, Soviet era writers that we didn't really weren't able to read or um, you know were occluded by a, a more more hegemonic idea of, of what literature is supposed to be, right? So anyway, I was just thinking about that, and that maybe these trans these aren't developments. Like maybe they're just totally like it might not be a progressive development from the shamanic to home to like Homer and telling the tale of, of, of Odysseus or uh, to like other kinds of epic poems and other traditions like are they necessarily progressive or are there shifts that are broken of breaks because of things like the industrial revolution right uh, or the internet revolution like maybe there are there are breaks in the way we think about communication itself right um, uh, that our anxiety is about communication, about being able to communicate. <laughs> um, uh, even like here when everybody's thinking like, is Zoom really a communication? Are we losing touch with each other? Do we see each other enough in person? All of these things, right? Um, they engender shifts and uh, new, new paradigms for thinking about what, what poetry is. And we, so we don't really know yet. <laughs> So that it might not be a development or a progress, right? It, we, it's sort of our tale about his about the history of poetry, but it's I feel like it, the translation is a really interesting uh, aspect of that because it constantly moves one time period into another time period, one culture into another culture. You know, the way that Pound's Cafe affected English language poetry in the 20th century is phenomenal, like because that those poems from a thousand years ago change the way American poetry is valued, is read, what it's read for, why it's read, you know, all of that. <laughs> uh, so that kind of thing makes me think that it's very asynchronous, these developments, and, and very broken, and, and, and also very much more con interconnected between literatures and histories and cultures than we, than we maybe expect. It's like a linear progress of a particular tradition. Like what's an American tradition? And I think this is a very good time to read your poetry, not translations, but Matvey Nkilevich's poetry. Okay. In, as proof or as a kind of, um, what is the word, like um, a rebuttal of what I have just said, I'm not sure. Um, I'm gonna, I'll read some poems that I either finished or was editing or finish, or I, I don't know anymore about the timeline of my own poems. <laughs> um, they just keep going through different processes. So, but I'm gonna read a few things that I think were kind of either written or came together during the first two months of lockdown. Uh, and this is from a series that I've been working on for about five or six years called From a Winter Notebook. Imagine that I do what is essential only, walk past a church or subsidized commuter homes, past children reaping joy from movement of their bodies in this pink light, gone puce of early setting sun. Voices from the roof fall to the ground, they're human. They may lack personhood, but their timbre holds accounts and class is as if augured in the wind, emblazoned as a crest upon their cadence. Shadow creeping over me, is it you? Whose key is in my lock? My friends, my mostly smiling sound bites, bluntly tapping 
quick fire news year in, year out upon the screen that fades to crystalline true silence when inactive. I've seen your cursor flashing, flashing next to mine. And if I took these poems to the livid street in mad abandon, in stockinged feet half naked, you'd sign the affidavit for the state to take possession of my will or vouch for me and tell me in a letter, soon luck will turn, keep scribbling on what lunar scraps are given. I pluck my eyebrows one by one to play the part. Pray curtain opens on the depth of winter. Enter, examined omni. That's a poem, I guess, from uh, recently, <laughs> which, which uh, seems to maybe take on some of the things of the day, you know? But I think poems do, right? They, like I was saying about Mandelstam, like seeing this, his friend's artwork in a magazine and then writing a poem, you know, <laughs> that kind of references it or even references his name, you know? And similarly, like, I'm sure some of this poem came out of being, thinking about being in this lockdown situation or uh, technology and poetry and um, both, and, and class and, uh, thinking about class in my apartment building on the different floors, <laughs> but also incorporating some something from like this Chinese poem. I can't remember where I got it. Something about plucking my eyebrows that comes from like some kind of Chinese opera thing or I forget what it was. <laughs> it doesn't need an explanation, but it it's interesting that these things kind of like come together and uh, it's kind of consciousness, right? But then there's a lot of artifice uh, in terms, for me, what, what I'm interested in right now is structuring the sound patterning and the the way the, the poem moves um, syllabically also and, and such. Um, but you might have heard like some locutions that are like outmoded or old fashioned sounding, <laughs> um, which are, you know, uh, or, or inversions and things that I hope imply like a kind of obsolescence <laughs> of poetry. <laughs> Would you share, uh, it's a writing process, so it's kind of like, I feel it's, it, it's a bit intrusive, but you, you already started to speak about it. When you, when the poem comes to you, do you hear it? Do you see it? Do you see it written? Do you see it as a, as a, as a visual, you know, as a, a flow of images? Everybody does it differently. So what's your... I think, is it, um, Rene Damal thinks that we have a, uh, uh, there's a third kind of uh, language space between languages. Um, so if you're, it, it's this thinking space that's not quite language. I forget the word he has for it. It has to do with pho photon or something like that. Uh, so it's this like non-linguistic space that language, that then to, from which land, language comes. And I think sometimes the poem space is there, like there's some sound, but it's not quite the words yet. Uh, yeah, I, I've had the experience of you walk down, you take a long walk and suddenly there's the, the lines of po the lines of the poem or something rhythmic or a few words start to form. And then by the time I get home, I've forgotten it. And then I have to try to reconstruct or maybe I remember a phrase and then I start doing something else because I'm not going to get back there. But most often I think, you know, this question of where is, you know, the question is which, what is the poem? Like what are, is the poem there to hear? Is the poem there to see? The poem, to my mind, isn't there until you make it. So uh, it's just, it's not that, whatever that was, that thing that I experienced in the park, while wow, like with this amazing new poem coming to my brain and like I'm mouthing it or like if I were Mandelstam, I would be mumbling it uh, or speaking it out loud, walking and, 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 but that's still not the poem. Like we think that the poem is some kind of original, you know, like this primary thing and, and somehow you get it. But actually it seems to me in my experience, it only, the only thing I can call poem is the thing that I, 
read to you and print in a book because it's the thing that I've actually uh, made. And uh, maybe I'm a materialist or something, but I, I don't think that the poem exists otherwise. So what I'm hearing or seeing or imagining isn't quite the poem yet. You know, the scribbling process, later the editing, typing it up, editing, um, reading it, going back, re-editing, scrapping parts of it, moving parts from another poem into it or from somebody else's poem, <laughs> hopefully so they don't notice, into it, <laughs> uh, or maybe they're dead, so it doesn't matter. I feel like that there is the poem. In that, in that process, I'm getting to the poem. It's not that I'm reaching back to some originary poetic state that I just saw or flashed or was in, you know, a voice in my ear or something, you know? <laughs> um, so I, I feel more, William Morris says that art is uh, the, uh, the resistance of the material, right? Um, it's in that resistance that art actually that is made, right? The material is resisting you, you act upon it, you work with it, and you make it, make something from that. Um, and, you know, maybe William Morris seems kind of silly to quote, but, but actually he had some interesting ideas, especially uh, around uh, sort of uh, his, his not, not exactly Marxist uh, version of socialism. Um, and and the place of the arts and or and of craft and work in inside a kind of utopian socialist um, society, which I, I find actually quite intriguing. Um, but you know, and actually, I think Mandelstam's ideas about the stone and uh, Acmeist ideas are very similar, and they occur uh, very soon after Morris. Actually, um, the idea of the workshop, <laughs> the worker, or the craftsperson, you know, yeah. Anyway, is that a good answer about process? Yeah, it's as, <laughs> as good as any answer about the poetic process. It's a, your process, and it's fascinating. Would you read another poem? But this one connects to Russian poetry very, in a tiny way, because it, it, it alludes to a poem by Marina Tsvetaeva. But it also alludes to another poem that some of you will know. It sounded so much better before I wrote it down. Apropos of our current discussion, sorry to break <laughs> the silence, the sacred space of the poem, but apropos of that, like, right, it sounded so much better before I wrote it down. Like I couldn't get the poem <laughs> um, from the park into my apartment. <laughs> anyway, sorry. It sounded so much better before I wrote it down. Even my jealousy sing seemed winged like marinas. Does the road wind uphill all the way? My teeth will rot, but I'll be rot, I hope, before that happens. Then will words mean what they say, finally? Then will you stop asking? Like strawberries, late kisses make my lips itch. Lately, all I see in whom I love is aging. Their eyes dig deeper dead birds underfoot. Will there be only one rhythm in hell? One sound? Must I walk to the very end? Cell towers have replaced the guard posts. Serpentine parkways coil upward, middle paths to mediocre death. Science finds cigarettes addictive. I feel the same about tomatoes. Actually, it's people, our ken for adaptation. It was my job, they say. I did what I was told. Yes, sir. No, sir. Let's have ourselves one last good laugh at ourselves and drop the curtain. That's what I miss most with you, that laughing. After you had found me frozen at the bus stop, pulled me back, though you didn't want me, running barefoot naked over winter avenues. Thank you. We will get more to poetry because it's, I feel that that's the main thing, but let's, let's get back to translation. Uh, I have a selfish interest in that because as I said, I'm a very big fan of your Pushkin's translator, translations. Oh. And I know that uh, recently um, it came uh, in a new publication, right? Because before it was just on internet and now it became a book. 
And uh, will you talk a little bit about it and maybe read a part? Yeah, okay. maybe? yeah. thank you. Uh, it was sort of a pirated version online or a kind of accidental version online that I didn't even know about. Um, but then I, uh, that had to do with the, um, uh, Sergei Dresnin's uh, operetta or art, art song kind of version of the plague, uh, the, the feast during the plague, which is a Pushkin play from 18, 1830, uh, when Pushkin was in uh, quarantine, basically. Well, not exactly, but close enough. And he spent the late summer and or in the fall, uh, unexpectedly, a long three or four month period, and in a state, a family estate in Boldino, which is, I forget how many, uh, I think I wrote it down, some miles from Moscow, 400 miles east. And um, uh, he didn't expect to be there, but cholera broke out. So, um, and there was a, you know, it was pretty freak, you know, not infrequent and something we should probably be expecting in our near future, not infrequent outbreaks. Um, and so he spent a few months in quarantine and finished uh, Eugene Onegin and did all sorts of, wrote a ton. He wrote a ton. It was good for him. Maybe the delay of getting married was good or whatever it was. So one of the things he did was the little tragedies of which one of them one of the little tragedies is this feast during the plague. I don't know if you can see. I made a little booklet of it. Um, uh, so, so uh, yeah, uh, there, that's maybe easier to see. So, uh, so I made this little booklet um, during lockdown because I had some type and some paper and <laughs> and a and a some paper left over from something. Anyway, so I I hand and kind of handmade it. Um, and I also published, I reworked the translation a little bit because uh, it's been about 20 years since I did this work. So I published it also in, uh, in translation um, of Brooklyn Rail venue online. So you can read the whole thing there and a little essay I wrote about it on, uh, in translation. And um, so 20 years ago, I had worked with Sergei Dresnian, which is something you were interested in, uh, Zarina, about uh, like working with music. So I, I originally translated this poem for a uh, performance. So it was to his music. So, um, and because he wrote his music to the Pushkin text in Russian, I had to, it was a lot stricter in terms of rhythm and uh, rhyme and well the, there's rhyme in only the songs that appear in the, in the text but um but the interesting thing about this text also is that it is itself a translation of a, a of a 1815 play of by a, a lesser known english romantic so so it's pushkin's translation and someone recently asked me like why the hell did you translate it back you could just take that part from the the, in, the English so-called original, and uh, it's a, a Scottish uh, romant, romantic poet, John, um, John Wilson, who wrote something called The City of the Plague. It's really long and tedious, and the language there is like, it's kind of terrible. It's just like, you look at it and you're like, Pushkin modernized this language. 15 years later, he like made it actually sound like well, he wrote it in, in a Russian that he has like hints of the idea of an anachronist kind of or a like stylization of some kind of medieval thing because it's about the plague, you know? So it has like a hint of this and that as though, and he kind of hints toward English quite a bit in this trans, in his translation, I think, or his version. And uh, he translated just like a very small scene. But it, it really is a new work in Pushkin. And of course, the songs that he translated are totally different because he wanted, you know, he was dealing with also meter and rhyme in, in those uh, parts in a way that, you know, it was important for him to, for them to be like songs uh, and not like stilted translations of an English song. So to translate, so I, I, I think it was a good idea to translate. I, I revisited that question, I do think actually it's a good idea to, read, to translate Pushkin's text as a kind of original, even though it is also a translation of an English text. It's 8 p.m. here, so I, I poured myself a glass of wine. I hope you don't mind. And it's, it's fitting for this, uh, what I'm about to read. 
I should have brought mine as well. So this is from the middle of the play. Um, the people who are hanging out during the plague and having a good time uh, want, and they have this one guy who's like elected chairman of their festivities. Um, and he, they ask him to sing uh, uh, an ex some kind of riling song, uh, some kind of something to cheer them up at this table outside. They're, they're also obeying the rules. They're about 10 people and they're, they're outside, but they're not wearing masks, I don't think. And, uh, and, but they are really close to a graveyard where they're at the same time burying people who are dead of the plague. So it's kind of unseemly, their, their festivities. So, so, and this is the chairman's song. When great and mighty winter stirs, and like a chieftain wrapped in furs, upon us sends its shaggy soldiers of biting frost and stinging snow, it's met with fire's crackling smolder and wintry warmth of feasts aglow. Her terrible majesty, the plague, herself does now offensive take. Rich harvests reaps herself to flatter, Upon our windows day and night, her graveyard shovels, shovel knocks and clatters. What can be done? How can we fight? As from the winter pest we hide, we'll also lock the plague outside. Will fire's light, will fill our chalice, and merrily our minds will drown, and brewing feasts and balls for solace will glorify the plague's new crown. There's rapture in a battle, bliss, upon the brink of the abyss and in the raging ocean's fury midst angry waves and darkness vague and in the desert whirlwinds hurry and in the breeze that brings the plague all all that threatens us with death hides for the mortal in its depth an inexplicable enchantment a promise of eternal life He's lucky who in dire moments has tasted of these sweet delights. We sing your praise, long live the plague. We do not fear the darkest grave. We will not shy from your endeavor. We'll drink the maiden's rosy breath and clang our foaming cups together and both are filled perhaps with death. Also, I have to say that there is some kind of like you know, you want to translate it in a way that isn't like cheesy or something, but inevitably also in the original, there is a certain kind of sentimentality and like over overwrought emotion, right? Um, so it's hard, it's hard like as a translator with, you know, a, a modicum of, I don't know, some kind of like restraint, I find it sometimes hard to translate this kind of text because I, uh, I'm like, well, this is like really over the top, <laughs> but but that's what's there, you know. And in in a way, it's there in the English uh, play from nineteen eight from eighteen fifteen, and in Pushkin's play, he's also playing up some of this sort of um, overwrought um, kind of. They're cheering on the plague and that, and there's a lot of kind of cliche tropes: the maiden's rosy breath. You know, it's something that would be part of the of the vernacular song. You know. It doesn't, you can't get away from the cliche. Sometimes you actually need the cliche um, to make it work for, in my mind. I, I think it really works. It's just mind blowing the way you captured the rhythm. Tsaritsa grozna chuma, tipir idiot na nas sama, ilstitsa jatvu bagate, iknam vakoshka dnum iv noch stuchit magilnu lapate. So I'll stop here, but you can see that it's exactly this rhythm. I, I caught it because I was, when I, I didn't know it was a pirate version, so I actually staged it for the show we did with the Arts Collective in 2016, and we, we used the music as well. So oh, okay. it was a wow. different type of music, and I caught that it was exactly to the same the same rhythm that you were doing now that probably your composer did and it also uh fits exactly into this film that somebody uh just mentioned in, in um uh, stars just mentioned in the chat here the soviet 
famous mm -hmm. uh, little tragedies film. So it's this Pushkin rhythm. And I did read Wilson's play a long time ago, and it leaves so little with you that I can't remember whether it did or not. And I suspect that it didn't, but you you and Pushkin, you really <laughs> got it. So I've, I've really enjoyed it. And the same goes for Mary's song, which has a completely different rhythm, yeah, but it also might into the music and um, which is the question about translation do you think that there might be something into translate into the music maybe that's how it should be done it's a good idea i mean it it helps i mean i think you you kind of you do that a little bit by reading the poem uh out loud or even prose I'm just reading it over and over again. Um, with harms, there's certainly, even in the prose, there's a certain kind of rhythm, right? Um, and and humor has rhythm, you know, and it's necessary uh, where a sentence stops, where it abruptly begins and whatever, right? Uh, I mean, I would sit with Sergei Dresnin in his apartment at the, at the big piano, like, I think it was a grand, maybe a small, I don't know, a small grand. And he would bang out this melody over and over. And I was like, no, we got to change this word. You know, this, the rhythm is, so it was really, I don't know if I would have done it quite the same way. I think it works for the song. It doesn't, but in the other parts of the translation, it really didn't have to be like where they're just the speaking parts. You know, you know, it's nice uh, that it works with the music for his, because he had the goal of staging it. it. Didn't have to be that way. For the songs, for sure. I mean, they're really meant to sound like songs, right? So it really helped um, to hear the music, even whatever music, because he had written the music to Pushkin's language, right? Um, but there were also things that were specific to Dresnin's music that were, you know, that may have not been what Pushkin had in mind, right? He's translating that rhythm into some other, you know, he had he had a kind of, it's sort of like an art song, cabaret, but slightly like modernist, atonal moments, you know? So like, he had a different vibe and it, it turned it into a little bit of Kurt Weill. So that's also a cultural translation that, that um, happens like, because Sergei comes out of that tradition after uh, Weill and Brecht. So there was that kind of being imposed on the Pushkin from a hundred years later, right? Um, so that's kind of curious too, like the way that the music was itself, um, move, you know, pushing the, the, the Pushkin text in a slightly new direction. And you read some Mandelstam already, and it would be nice to have a little bit more on Mandelstam, who, by the way, you know, infamously said that uh, the, the word should go back into the music just mm. yeah, so it kind of ties in but can we yeah. spend some time on or with harms and maybe you can read uh, some translation there are lots of fun things to read in harms um but um i feel like to read in this audience to read the classic most well-known ones would be kind of boring uh, or um you know you all know about the bread-headed man who had no hair and you probably know about the all the the guy who's watching the old women as they fall out of their win the window, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one. So, I I don't know if I need to read those particular pieces, <laughs> um, but I thought maybe reading um, a piece that I really love um, that has a slightly different. Um, uh, if you don't know, you could get this book today. I wrote nothing. <laughs> um, uh, there's a new, unfortunately, the new edition isn't as cool looking as this one, but it has his face on it. So as he said, you get to look at an intelligent face when he sent his own photograph to Alexander Vedensky, who was living in, in Kharkov and, and Harms thought that he really needed to see an intelligent face. So, um, uh, well, you know, jokes among friends. And, uh, these uh, translations came out uh, a good while ago in this book, but it's in print. And uh, the, the poems were written in the third 20, late 20s and 30s, prose and poems and plays. And there's a longer story in here too. Uh, well, maybe because we were talking about Russian literature, I'll briefly read uh, 
one that I worked on with Eugene Staszewski. Uh, and then I'll read my favorite, one of my favorite sort of less, more oblique ones. So this is called uh, Something About Pushkin. It's hard to say something about Pushkin to a person who doesn't know anything about him. Pushkin is a great poet. Napoleon is not as great as Pushkin. Bismarck compared to Pushkin is a nobody. And the Alexanders first, second, and third are just little kids compared to Pushkin. In fact, compared to Pushkin, all people are little kids except Gogol. Compared to him, Pushkin is a little kid. And so instead of writing about Pushkin, I would rather write about Gogol. Although Gogol is so great that not a thing can be written about him, so I'll write about Pushkin after all. Yet, after Gogol, it's a shame to have to write about Pushkin. But you can't write anything about Gogol, so I'd rather not write anything about anyone. Interestingly, that was, thank you, that was written uh, just two months before the Mandelstam poem that I read. It's just such a, to think about these things happening simultaneously, it's sort of weird, right? This is from very shortly after, very shortly before Harms was arrested. This is August 17th, 1940, or his third arrest actually. But the one that was final. Oh, no, I'm wrong. Actually, I'm sorry. So it's a year before, exactly a year before his final arrest. How easy it is for a person to get tangled up in insignificant things. You can walk for hours from the table to the wardrobe and from the wardrobe to the couch and never find a way out. You can even forget where you are and shoot arrows into some small cabinet on the wall. Beware cabinet, you can yell at it. I'll get you or you can lie down on the floor and examine the dust. There is inspiration in this too. It's best to do it on a schedule in conformity with time. Although it's difficult to determine the time limit for what are the time limits of dust. It's even better to gaze into a tub of water. To look at water is always good for you and edifying, even if you can't see anything about it. It's still good. We looked at the water and saw nothing in it. And soon we got bored. But we comforted ourselves that still we had done a good deed. We counted on our fingers. But what were we counting? We didn't know. For is water in any way countable? 20 years, I feel like I've been trying to hammer his name into the American literary consciousness. <laughs> Well, I personally never get tired of hearing harms or about harms, and we already had one program of Alexander Segal translations of harms and Marion Goff. There was just two in one. That was an interesting combination. And I'm sure we'll have more, <laughs> but um, uh, perhaps more Mandelstam than from your newest pro pro project. And this is also from early 1937. You can't compare the living to the dead. With something like caressing fright, I yielded to the evenness of planes afflicted by the sky's circle. I'd address my faithful servant, air, awaiting its assistance or some word, raising the sails, sailing the curve of always unbegun adventures. Where there's more sky for me, I'll wander willingly. And this apparent longing won't release me from the Veronese hills still spry toward those all human Tuscan ones becoming clearer. So it's Mandelstam's yearning for world culture, right? <laughs> We're yearning for the hills of Tuscany and Dante and so forth but in his Veronese Hills, which are still young. Um, um, yeah, it's an odd poem, but you can't compare the living to the dead. I always, I really like that um, opening. And is he thinking about someone like Dante and himself or how a poet deals with the past? Mandelstam always thinking about the age or time as a kind of 
sometimes as um, an enemy or sometimes as a friend. Um, this is from a little bit earlier, 35, 36. Um, Not as the white moth dusted with flower to the earth will I return this borrowed ash. I want this thinking body transformed into a street, a country, this spinal charred body conscious of its length. The call of the dark green pine needles wreaths the color of a well's depth, pull life and precious time along, leaning on mounts of death, red flag, pine needles in a ring, wreaths like bold alphabets. Comrades of the latest draft, going about their work in the coarse skies, silently the infantry carries by exclamations of rifles on their shoulders and thousands of anti-aircraft guns, eyes either brown or blue, walking in disorder people upon people who will continue in their stead. That's from the first notebook. <clears throat> I like the weird shift from thinking about how my body is returned into the earth to thinking about this parade or, or funeral, maybe uh, procession in Red Square with wreaths and, uh, and the exclamation points of the rifles on the shoulders of the soldiers. And I could read a poem that sort of, in a way, I just realized, even though this, I wrote this a while before I translated that poem, but it also kind of has a sort of, it refers to a Soviet film suddenly. <laughs> and maybe it also has a similar shift, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, because it's, it has to do with the body leave or the body leaving or the the life force leaving the body and then like the, the the world around that it's in this book called some worlds for dr vote sometimes electricity itself makes noise buzzing without will or instinct this world also fades the impulse original electric goes elsewhere or to a remove from a body tired of itself nor can it be said to act at all if a light goes out when the circuit is broken. It buzzed in lightning bugs and the clouds moved on. The clouds where the sun set on that day were full of rose water, geranium pink, then slowly turned gray, soft and blended with the pallor of the atmosphere. You noted it to be most still that afternoon to evening. There were barbecues firing up for summer, their cinders burned long. The leaves were still, but the ants bustled. No rustle in the trees while the water flowed and the sky surged slowly in circles. You lift a hand and watch it stay in place. And what is it? Hmm, sorry. You lift a hand and watch it stay in place. And what is that burn from, from the other day? And what is it like to be still while you still are in this world? You can push the air around a while longer. You can dress yourself and cast shadow. Onward, communists, the banner flaps in the film. Onward, the soldiers sing. How about you just tell us anything you want or anything that you feel is important about you as a publisher, or you publish and, and teaching, so. Uh, important? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I'm excited about a few projects coming out. Um, we're like Lena Rimbu book. Um, uh, it's going to be, I think, really interesting to see how contemporary American younger poets hopefully get to see what a counterpart uh, is doing in, uh, in Russian at this time. And um, her work is extremely political, but also in, uh, and at the same time, extremely personal and complex and difficult linguistically. And also, we're putting out a book uh, that I'm excited about, um, a, couple of kind of, a couple of kind of historical projects in different veins. One about the small press, 
with actually edited by Kyle Schlesinger, who's here in the audience, um, uh, which is uh, an inter a, a book of interviews with uh, poet publishers who are also printers, and it's about letterpress printing and publishing poetry, sort of with your body. <laughs> uh, and then uh, also a really a curious, a book that might be curious to some people in this audience, and that's uh, called the Wayland Rudd Collection, which comes out next spring, and I'm hurrying to finish this book um, uh, with Yevgeny Fix. Uh, the project is basically a compendium of uh, images uh, from Soviet posters and newspapers um, that are uh, images uh, that are um, of mostly of African or African Americans. Um, and it's about race in the Soviet imaginary and um, about media images, um, how race was used for political purposes and uh, in, in the Soviet Union in the Cold War period. So, or not, actually it starts pretty early on. And, um, and it's a really interesting collection of images, but also it's got a collection of essays uh, from the philosopher Ruth Gordon, to, who's uh, like a Fanon scholar, to poets, uh, people who, from, who remember life in the Soviet Union in the 60s, including uh, an African-American woman who studied in Moscow in, uh, in the 60s, early 60s at Lumumba. Uh, her recollections about race and uh, being an African-American in the Soviet Union at that time, but also people, Russian writers who are reminiscing about what their understanding of race was in uh, growing up in the Soviet Union and also a lot of uh, art history and uh, media scholars writing about um, this kind of particular uh, Soviet um, uh, media image uh, and the, rac the racial image in, in, um, uh, in the Soviet press and uh, propaganda. And I think it's gonna be a really, really interesting collection. I mean, it is an interesting collection. I think it'll be a really beautiful book to and, and weird, uh, an interesting subject matter to think about in the context of our time uh, and the ways that race is uh, utilized or politicized and so forth. So, um, and to see it from the, the sort of leftist angle of, of how Soviet Union is using it. So, um, but also a bunch of poetry books and uh, translations, Argentina, um, a couple of a translation coming out very soon from a Colombian writer and a Martinican writer. So we have, I'm, I'm excited about the fall and we've been doing this pamphlet series. Some of you might be interested in the, particularly if you're interested in Russian stuff in the Skidan, Alexander Skidan pamphlet about Dmitry Prigov, that's out. And also, um, uh, but there are 20 pamphlets this year we've done um, where, where some of them are still going to the printer now. Um, and they're on a range of subjects um, and with a really broad international array of writers. So I'm quite excited about that project. But next year we will not do a pamphlet series. It's, it's really hard, but it's been great to put the writing out really fast. Like a lot of people are just finishing their essays and then we edit and go straight to print. Um, so uh, that's been really good and a lot of the work is on topics that are really important now and um, from co collectivity to um, performance to translation to, yeah. I think we're doing a pretty good thing and I, I'm really happy with, you know, it's been a collective, volunteer collective for many years and very, we just recently, we really formed a staff so that we're paying that, um, so it's been a very long <laughs> process <laughs> to be, to, it's been interesting to be a publisher and then and also become a publisher like at the same time like it's always happening like you're always becoming <laughs> what you think what you said you were <laughs> you said you were a publisher so you keep doing it and you become one um uh and it changes um but. well we we didn't get to teaching but i guess oh. If there's anything you want to, are we are we anyway in enlightenment? <laughs> yeah, I just 
uh, I'll just say I've been teaching a class on translation, and it's called Experiments in Translation, and I've been really enthusiastic uh, about this subject, uh, and the students are really fueling my enthusiasm. I teach at Columbia's MFA program, and there's a really great translation, sort of like a, a minor or like an additional certificate program. If you're in nonfiction or pure fiction, you can also do translation. Susan Bernowski is our our our, our leader, um, and um, it's a it's a program I've been really lucky to teach in. And um, so sometimes I teach book arts and small press related stuff, um, book, thinking about books. That, Usually once a year I teach a translation course and this year it's on experiments in translation, which I've done a bit in past years. And I'm looking at really strange and way out kind of ways of translating. So it's been it's been exciting and also head spinning a little bit because I'm also trying to do this like kind of traditional translation project and at the same time with Mandelstam and being very thorough, but I'm also like really interested in translations that go very far afield and uh, question the whole idea of the derivative and the original and all sorts of things. So um, I'm happy to talk about those things um, at some point with any of you. <laughs> uh, it's a subject I've been kind of researching and intrigued in and trying to write about. Apparently, particularly particularly because I feel like there's a, even though translation is such a it, it seems to have like a boom at the moment in American literature maybe a, uh, a kind of acknowledgement that we've been very solipsistic for a long time, but um, and and a guilt we're feeling a but it also is you know world global capital and world, you know that that fuels a lot of this surge of interest in translation and so I'm I'm you know uh, but I, I'm in, I'm thinking a bit about why the translator is still such a feared figure in the US literary context <laughs> um, and what what is our what is our uh, moment say what is the, the way that we think about translation as, as Nietzsche would say reflects quite a bit on how we think about history and uh, how our moment, like our consciousness of history and our, ourselves in history. Uh, and so I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm confused a little bit about our, our moment <laughs> and how we think about uh, translation um, now. Uh, you know, I've, I've experienced a lot of, I've noticed in my life as a translator, a lot of fear of the translator who has a foreign name. I have, experience the fear of the translator who knows the context. Uh, you know, uh, even in the theater world, often this happens, especially in the theater world where translators aren't, like the use value of the translator would be so great, like to be a dramaturg, basically, to say like, this is, you know, it's not just a text divorced from its context. It's got all this, it's got all this stuff around it and unfortunately the theater is always scared of translators because they, I don't know they think they're gonna have to pay for it or you know even at BAM uh, when they did the harms production at BAM and the Baryshnikov did the production they didn't want anything to do with me or Eugene or you know, it's like it's, it's incredible um, we even proposed to have a panel with them uh, but, you know, the, they hired someone who's an obvious English writer who the, the, the name is English. The name won't make anybody suspicious. Um, the, they, who's famous to do a tr an adaptation, which was, of course, based on everybody's translations, because how could this guy who didn't know Russian make a translation, right? So everybody's work, whoever's worked on harms is in there, but nobody gets credit. <laughs> and Bam don't, doesn't want to talk to you because they're scared. <laughs> so what is it they're scared of? So I'm really interested in that kind of um, uh, fear of this, of the otherness of the translator. Because <laughs> the translator is this bridge figure who magically moves between and is potentially bringing disease with him <laughs> or her or they. Well, I, I think this is probably the time when we open it to question and answers. What are you talking about? Uh, the, the, the fear of, of um, a 
the translator's otherness, uh, as well as the questions of context. What do you think about the idea of English language sort of becoming uh, the closest thing to an international language? I'm a translator um, um, as well. I, I translate poetry. And for me, it's a... Um, it, it feels like this huge, uh, huge gap between uh, the possibility of uh, of uh, connecting with the with a with, with the poem, uh, especially I, I don't know I, I guess I want to say especially a Russian poem from the 20th century because it's so uh, intimately entwined with history and uh, and biographies and even the biographies of individual poets oftentimes end up being so deeply intertwined with those of other poets and and, uh, and uh, just the whole sphere of culture and history uh, and, and society. And, and so when you look at, uh, at poetic translations um, in in that way, it, it feels like to even, even to present an accurately translated work uh, in English without uh, somehow communicating that sort of scope of, uh, of, of context is a uh, uh, I, I feel like it would be impossible to, to pick up on the, on the subtext uh, or especially with someone like, like Mandel Stamm who is literally writing uh, a, a lot of things that has to sort of like a double bottom or, or anyone writing in, in the 30s. Yeah, I mean, um, what I'm trying to do now, my friend John and I are trying to do with Mandel Stamm is create some kind of useful translation that might help a reader find that find out about Mandelstam. A lot of it has to do with pre really, pre really being careful with the 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 meaning uh, in terms of like just semantics and sort of and grammar. Or what is he saying? Because that has been lost in a lot of translations. But also, I'm writing commentary for every poem, or I. I will be, I, I'm working on notes and readings. I have a lot to read, I have a lot to learn, you know, and because Mandelstam is never like a specialty of mine or anything, I know I've spent my 20s working on harms and um, um, and I was always afraid of translating Mandelstam for some of the reasons that you mentioned, you know, and also because he's like a great figure of modernism. It's like translating Eliot or Pound into Russian, you know, it's like daunting. Um, and scary for me, uh, uh, but it does feel like important to find a way to make it a useful thing. You know, you're never going to be able to. You know, it's not a it's not a representation, right? Translation isn't a representation. It has to be an enactment of some kind. It's an interpretation. You know, um, and I, I don't totally agree with Nabokov that everything has to have t towers of Footnotes, you know, um, the way that he did Onegin and so forth. Like there, there's got to be something about the text that that you're very uh, that does transmit something. It's done in such a way that you can dig around in the English poem the way you would if you're a Russian reader dig around in the Russian poem and try to figure it out, right? Um, and I think having to preserve the complexity is so important. And I think it's really important right now, I, I've figured out, I don't know, just for me, that this question of the English hegemony, I've been really interested in, in a way, in translating this more difficult Russian author uh, in, on, the, on the sort of language level than Harms seems, right? Harms is difficult in another way, but on, a, on you know, vocabulary is, you know, he's a kind of a Beckett and he, he's like making an impoverished vocabulary, right? Um, and that's a different difficulty to translate. But um, in, in Mandelstam's case, I'm, I'm interested in trying to create a difficult poem in the, in the English and not make it easy, but also not make it like senseless, right? <laughs> um, or like uh, impossible to decipher. But in the moment of the English, of, of the hegemony of the English language, I think it's super important to translate these most difficult things and translate them in the way that the English, you're really pushing the English to be more difficult. Because it's so, like you said, like, you know, some writers in Eastern Europe are writing in English because they just think, well, it's the only way I can get a broader audience outside of 
you know, my small language and, um, and get into European festivals that, you know, now they're on hold, maybe some of, most of them, but they're going to start happening and they pay, you know. <laughs> um, so um, this, the problem of English as a hegemonic language and translating into it is, is something I'm very much aware of or nervous about, but I don't really yet know how to deal with it except by trying to push it in this way of like, like, like translating the stuff that is, is not really available or isn't, um, or, or provides a more complicated picture of, of an era or of a poet or, um, I'm working on Yelena Gro, who is also really a strange writer and how to like make that strange in English, um, and not cute. Um, uh, the way it could sound. Um, she's like barely known in Russia, right? So like trying to change, you know, translators are always changing the course of, you know, maybe, uh, you know, Harms has a, you know, obviously a following in Russia, but uh, Videnski barely known <laughs> really in Russian, right, except for poets who read him. Um, but Videnski, you know, had this second life in this weird way in English. So I can't totally and I, and I like that, you know, I want, I think there is Benjamin's idea of like this, you know, new life of the work in the translation. Um, it does mean something for me. It, it, it is, was exciting to read Videnski to a new audience. And actually, I think Videnski might be as well known in, in English now as in Russian, <laughs> if not more, <laughs> which is bizarre, and has actually influenced young American poets. I, I've, I've seen younger American poets who are interested in surrealism who like really got allowed a lot out of the landscape and, and it, it influenced their work. And that's kind of like an amazing, weird, you know, Videnski's work would have been lost if that suitcase in Harms's apartment were lost. You know, there were no trace other than that. He never kept anything, you know. Uh, so, um, it's a miracle that we even have it and then to have it come out in English, it's totally kind of uncanny. But I don't know what that says to your question of the global uh, hegemony of English and the way that, you know, like in my poetry, I've noticed in the last few years that where as before, I used to try to work right in that almost global English because I was interested in the way that it was so narrowed and so kind of, so kind of, um, blank, like a, you know, degree zero style, like thinking about Barth, you know, like a degree zero of English, which is what we all kind of communicate with, with people in other countries <laughs> that speak English, but maybe they don't, they're not like in, in English in the same way. And so I've been actually, my poems, as you might have heard, are getting like, I don't know how this happened, but they're getting much more Englishy in the sense that they're going into earlier Englishes or odd Englishes and getting convoluted and more like grammatically complex um, than, than I had ever expected because I didn't really want to do this kind of Baroque work. It wasn't like something I wanted to do, but it's been happening more and more almost like a feeling of pushing against this, the, what I see in a lot of contemporary poetry as like a kind of reliance on a sort of uh, as if simple or like a sort of direct, um, you know, you could kind of compare it to the prominence of uh, the, um, what was it called, the Medvedev and um, the new, uh, the, not earnestness, but what was the word they used? This sort of idea of like a direct speech that is like really simple, prosaic, kind of came out of some American poetry, like very, Kind of connected to even Bukowski, who I don't like, or things that Kirill was translating, which made new sincerity, which made like a real impact in Russian. Uh, but now in English, like that kind of flatness, I'm not interested in it anymore because I, I think it's like, I'm more interested in making it difficult. First of all, Matvey, it was great to hear you talking and reading. I love the way you read. And what you said about making the English difficult resonates so deeply with me as a translator. Uh, 
I'm so happy to hear that. Uh, the question that I have is more of a technical nature. Of course, Mandelstam has been translated many times. And when you're doing a new translation, are you looking at the predecessors? Are you trying to keep away from uh, their finds, from the way they expressed it? Or you don't care? Or uh, is it that um, what comes out of your work is already without trying different? It's a really good question. And I know, Dmitri, that you're translating a lot of things that haven't been translated much or almost not at all, like Zabalotsky and things like that um, into English, and um, which is kind of incredible. You're doing incredible work. I, I think uh, we probably differ in some ways in the, in the idea of form in translation. And I, uh, I, but I very much respect what you're doing in terms of keeping form um at the forefront um and but to answer your question um i haven't looked much at older translators like i'll look at them i've actually been looking at the translators notes and translators introductions quite a bit because i'm interested in the way that mandelstam was framed in the 60s and 70s and even into the 80s uh during the cold war by the translators what and also what poems they decided not to translate and what reasons they give for that. That's really interesting to me. Um, you, know, um, you know, they won't translate the Stalin Ode, for instance, because it, uh, it's just a heinous hack work, you know, or whatever. <laughs> or they will, or they, also they're relying sometimes on Nadezhda Mandelstam's uh, versions that aren't necessarily always co correct to uh, the or not the only possible version of the poem. Uh, and those are sometimes quite politically motivated choices on her part. Um, and so I'm interested in how, uh, you know, how to deal with those slight differences uh, in the versions that exist, have been written down and um, the sem have been more recently published. And, um, but I, I do now, we do now, and both John and I sometimes look uh, at what, someone did with a poem. There, it's funny how different everything is, um, just because they're so hard to, they're, they're, it takes a lot of interpretation. And so, uh, and some people are more focused on creating a poem that sounds like Mandelstam, and some people are more focused on some kind of prose-like translation almost. And we fall, we're not doing the end rhymes for the most part, although in some cases where it seems more uh, folkloric, that that's where he's um, he's kind of he's reading a lot of Chlebnikov in that period, and so um, there is some very folk-oriented poetry uh, or, or influenced poetry that um, happens that you you do kind of need the end rhyme to make that um, resonate, but. It, even though we're not always looking at end rhymes, we're all looking at sound patterns a lot. Um, and when there's like a really important sound pattern, it also has to do with etymologies or connections between etymolo etymological connections in the poems. That's hard, but we're trying uh, to find ways of mirroring that. And, um, but to be honest, a lot of the time I just, when I look at poems, or translations of the poems from even the Merwin and Brown, I just see a lot of misprision in terms of like how the uh, grammatical structure is interpreted. Mm -hmm. and, um, so even though like there might be fines, like, oh, that's a great word, you know, we might have a different word, but you know, their word is really good for that word. But, but the sense of the sentence isn't quite right. Um, and so for me, it's not, it, even though like, you know, Benjamin says the unit is the word for, the, for, the, for translation, but for me, it's- No, it's really, not. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a romantic idea, but um, the, it's, for me, it's really like this sense, right? Or a sentence or kind of phrasal unit. How does it, you know, there are so many other important connections in the poem sound wise. And, and there's also something that the poet is, is saying, you know, yep. <laughs> that me is really important, especially with Mandelstam, because I don't think you can access the Veronish notebooks without kind of getting 
uh, you, you run into a lot of like, oh, what a great, beautiful poem. So many interesting images. But if you don't have the, the, the actual structure and the, you, you're, you're just the, the, the reader of the translation is just sort of floating in this sort of- uh, Yeah, it falls apart. Aura, like they get the aura of Mandelstam, but not like they can't really deal with the poem, right? We have another question on YouTube. So Linley is asking, are there particular conversations, questions, or arguments you find yourself having with Mandelstam? Is there anything you would want to ask him or discuss with him? Actually, I'm afraid of Mandelstam. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, I think, I don't know that he was a very good co co uh, interlocutor. <laughs> um, and, uh, or at least in the 30s, I think he had so, he was a really anxious uh, and unhealthy, you know, he was so anxious about his health and about what was going on with their situation in Voronezh and exile and like the, the fear of uh, arrest and all of that that I think he was a really nervous wreck in that time. And it, he was probably very, he was from all the reports from other people around him, he was really, had a great, really test, really bad temper. <laughs> and, or he was just in a, in a corner mumbling to himself, you know? So he's not like the kind of person that's easy to talk to. But also he's not, for me, even though now I feel in some ways through the translation, some influence, but it's more technical, I think. Uh, whereas with Harms, I really, the reason I started translating Harms and maybe the reason I started translating period is that I felt this really strong affinity with Harms and Harms was teaching me a lot about writing, about thinking about art, you know, about thinking about the, about artifice. Um, and, um, I learned a ton from Harms, and I also had a real desire to communicate some of what uh, some of the things that I was interpreting, obviously in, in, subjectively to some degree, but you know through my reading and um, research on Harms, I felt like I wanted to communicate Harms to my friends and to my fellow writers in English, um, and it really was a, a mission in a way. And it was Mandelstam, I feel a very different um, responsibility, but also a very, a very different impulse. Maybe it was not a project I wanted to do. And John asked me, and then I got kind of more roped in. But um, I, uh, I feel like I would have, I, I do have questions for him, but I don't know that I would want to ask him. I actually think he often was very misleading in his responses to people. It was very like uh, abrupt and uh, like laconic and kind of like um, uh, obtuse about um, certain things in his answers about the poems. But but the poems have so much like the, the, the what I'm ascertaining slowly in the poems, their logic is really um, um, uh, the, the logic of the poems is like telling me a lot about what he's thinking. Uh, his thinking about, um, about science, about uh, human history, about liter literary connections, um, um, about song and breath. And um, it's there in the poems. I kind of don't have to ask him, uh, or even if he were around. And I know he'd give me a really, like an answer that would just, uh, you know, just obfuscate things more. <laughs> so, so I'm kind of more like feeling like the poems have those answers to some degree. I mean, they're not like, there's not a key or a code or anything or, but they're, they're, and, and the interesting thing about the Veronish notebooks is the range that moves through this political landscape and this very personal landscape and it's all really confused and sometimes within one poem or poems written on the same day that they, they give clues for me to each other about his ambivalences and his, uh, and his, his, des his, his desires for the poems. I, I wanted to ask you, and it's kind of out of left field, but maybe not, but what I'm reading right now is mostly around 
because I haven't gotten my hands on the primary texts around Andrei Platonov. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering in your work and in your reading, what kind of relationship do you have with his texts and with his situation? He's one of the janitors in my lineage. <laughs> yes. Veliki <laughs> Dvornik. <laughs> you know that Gubinchikov song? Yeah, there is. <laughs> also, the, I think I forget who writes about that, about him, about... Uh, well, there, there was a wonderful essay for uh, by Robert Byrd. Oh, right. In e flux a few years ago. Uh -huh. That kind of focused my own thoughts about him. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm interested in your thoughts. You know, I, as a dilettante, I sometimes have to admit that I, I'm not a huge scholar of Platonov, though his no, writing... Personal, your personal relationship is fine. Uh, I mean, it is so jarring to read Platonov's um, Katlavan, The Foundation Pit, and it is a puzzle to me how, you know, how you would go about translating uh, that kind of prose. It's... Uh, it's so interesting to me uh, in terms of how it thinks about how he's thinking about Soviet language and the, the he's thinking about he's writing in a language that is transforming and he's letting he's not like you know Harms is sometimes writing with the old orthography and Mandelstam is also like obviously like a modernist poet from the pre-revolutionary but there is stuff in Mandelstam that you know you heard this thing about the Soviet you know the the air, the the comrades in the air, you know, like, and he has like, he does actually ad adopt, which probably from the translations that exist, we don't see that in Mandelstam so much. There is a kind of relationship Platonov in the use of Soviet, um, Soviet language uh, and the transformations of Soviet language. Mandelstam's language in the 30s is very different from, you know, the stone or something from the teens. Um, and it's partly Klebnikov and it's partly um, Soviet, the changes in Soviet language that uh, um, it, it make that happen. But um, I think Platonov is just like uh, a, some kind of bizarre wizard. Like there's no, uh, <laughs> there's no, like that is the, you know, when I first read Platonov, it was like, that is the highest standard. <laughs> like I will never write. Like so this. it's poetry. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, well, in the sense that it is poetry, I think, in the sense, in the social sense, because it was like he was giving this gift <laughs> that no one wanted and needed, but he is just so, um, he is such a puzzle to me. Um, I don't know, I, I haven't read everything by Platonov, uh, but there is something, um, it's like it's like down to earth in one in one way and Joycean in another way. It's like a very bizarre combination. You really liked Carl Chapek. This this would be a question about book art. Mm -hmm. One of the subjects you didn't touch upon. I'm curious to hear you talk about it. And this is a question from someone who uh, I guess the stuff that I write could be seen as I guess drafts or scripts or scores directed or addressed at or to uh, a future like-minded um, skilled printer, so to speak. Um, the one that maybe exists or maybe not, but one that has not, whom I have not encountered yet. So I'm curious about the, let's put it this way, the, 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 challenges, the challenges of the printing, of, of printing as trade, particularly um, livre d'artiste uh, and all, all, all the more high-end kind of editions, but also certainly in the more experimental field. I've read your essays on the Mimeo typography revolution back in the day, and I'm okay. curious where you see that the, the sort of the material as well as um, ideological and aesthetic issues now, what kind of, what kind of problems um, are you tackling on a sort of a day-to-day -day basis? What kind of, I don't know, um, Kinds of paper or kinds of ink, uh, I really rack, racking your brains on. <laughs> uh, that's a good, uh, really, thank you for that question. Um, 
you know, my thinking around print uh, has as much to do with ideas of circulation and distribution as they do with the material, like physical printing. I, I do print, and uh, but I'm not uh, like uh, as a dilettante in that field as well. I'm not, a, you know, a fine press printer, and I see what it might take to do that and I know that I, I don't have it in me but um, because partly because what I'm interested in is the way the text circulates uh, also um, and oftentimes with uh, more like the d'artiste tradition or that these things are really made for collectors and uh, limited fairly elite audience often uh, or for the museum or rare books room in a library and uh, that's not how I see like literary function, you know, related to print. Um, uh, I'm interested in how the work gets out there, and how it moves, and what's social about the book, you know. Um, so, but part of what's social about the book is the making, obviously. So, and it, it also about the people, sometimes the, the, the merchants that I'm involved with, like, buying paper or ink or parts to an old press or getting somebody to help me fix something that knows more about the machine. Um, so there's also the sociality of, of the of letterpress community, the printer's community that I, I'm really interested in. And I think Kyle was here earlier who is an in, impeccable printer and has a publish, is a publisher of Cuneiform Press also works between sort of trade publications and more like limited editions. I just finished working on a book that is, uh, I think, very important to the history of the artist book, but more in the sense of um, the artist book, not the Leave d'Artiste fancy artist book, but more the tradition that I'm interested in, which is more democratic, uh, or usually referred to as the democratic multiple tradition of the 70s and onward um, that often frequently employed commercial printing um, or cheap kinds of printing in the similar ways to small press uh, activities. Uh, and uh, I just did finished and is now waiting for copies of a book of Ulises Carrion, who's a Mexican poet who left uh, Mexico in 1970 and then moved to Europe. He, was, he left shortly after this sort of put, putting down of the student uh, protests in 68 there, uh, all of the unrest and political unrest in Mexico, and he was gay, and he definitely did not feel like he could stay there, so he moved to Europe, and um, he sort of transformed his poetry into a visual, uh, or into, I wouldn't say, not like concrete poetry exactly, but he started thinking about the book as a form of composition and he has this great art, uh, essay that came out in 1975 called The New Art of Making Books in which he says that the writer does not write, the writer uh, makes books. It's like the new writer. <laughs> the new idea of the writer is someone who's involved in every step of the material process of the book. Um, and Ulysses Carrion, uh, only recently, like there have been some retrospectives of his work. He went on to do work in video and social practice and died in the uh, uh, late 80s or early 90s of AIDS. And um, uh, yeah, he's just fantastic. And he did this whole series of things called book works, uh, which were poet, you know, he, he, the book that we republished, uh, and we also added a few accompanying essays, contemporary essays, and had to like reimagine, translate the book from its first form to this form of working in a different circulation uh, uh, in small press American publishing, and um, rather than in a kind of artist book 70s world, he had originally basically taken a sonnet by uh, by uh, Rossetti uh, and put it through 44 permutations uh, on a typewriter and um, things like so it, it, it the book is called sonnets and uh, it's fascinating he he just does something like uh, backwards sonnet and he just types out the whole thing backward or or something like interrogatory uh, sonnet, and he just puts a question mark at the end instead of a period. 
<laughs> it's like little, and some of, some of the manipulations are so tiny, you have to be very, really look for them. He'll like, he'll substitute one word and change, or like add one little thing, or, or it looks graphically different. Uh, but he originally did that on A4 paper with staples, and he did it in a very like uh, rudimentary fashion. Um, and we kind of transformed it into the book that it could have been using Gabriel Rossetti's uh, Dante, whatever, yeah, the DG, whatever, uh, his original end papers for the book, uh, for the book of his sonnets, which he designed, that Rossetti designed himself. So we used that in, in this very like bizarre book. Uh, so this sort of like arts and crafts or uh, pre-Raphaelite looking designs, combining them with the simplicity of the typewriter, but also having to transform it because we retypeset it. And so it's like certain things that were, that were done materially because the typewriter had this kind of quotation mark or this kind of setting in terms of the width of the letters, you know, certain things we had to translate digitally to work in, a new, in this new form. And it's no longer A4, it's like a small book. So, and there's also this material interest that I have in what, what is the translation of a material object. What it meant in his time was like, this is a staple thing of A4 paper. It's like pre-publication manuscript, you know, like, or it's off, office documents or, you know, all the connotations that would be present in that moment. But now if I republish that in the original form, it wouldn't have the same meaning, right? And it would be kind of a, sentimental maybe remembrance of that form. So I needed to find a way to create a, to design and print a, something that reenacted that gesture, but in a new context. Maybe I would just add the, the part of uh, what I've, what I've really loved about printing is, uh, and letterpress is the, the way you put together letters by hand, you know, and you see their impact in the paper, you know, and I think it's really important for Blake uh, to think about the intertwining of the, the visual language and the, the letters because he's constantly connecting them, you know, so that you don't have a foreground and a background, you know, and is similar with William Morris. It's a really interesting, but very different looking, but interesting way of thinking about the text is not divorced from the material. And I think that's affected me greatly, but, but experiencing it, like the, the, the doing of it is a very different uh, um, thing. And I, I've always wanted to write something with lead type. I mean, Johanna Drucker has done this where she composes on the letterpress and it's fascinating. Like, so that's a very different idea of time also. Like you're not writing, you're not typing, you're putting letter after letter, designing the page as you write it. And I think that's, just thinking about that, it's <laughs> mind blowing. And I, I, I hope someday I would have like a couple months to just do that for, a, for like one poem, you know, because <laughs> it would take a while. <laughs> But we, that's, I mean, to be continued, it's been fascinating. I know that people, I could see it. I see it from comments. I see it from facial expressions. People are really enjoying it. It's been uh, such a genuine, warm, open, uh, intelligent conversation about things that matter to us. Say, thank you very much for being here and sharing your brilliance with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, uh... I'm a little embarrassed, <laughs> but thank but thank you. you, thank you very much, and thanks for being, <laughs> thanks for hanging out with me for so long.